You're listening to King Jesus Radio, the official podcast of New Living Way Church. In tonight's study, we are in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 37 through 47, and the word is added. And tonight we're talking about how God added to the disciples and to him. And how many of us know that the only way that we can increase is in Christ, because God is the one that brings the increase. The, we'll be in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 37 through 47 tonight. And the word on this scripture is added. So this will be where we'll be tonight. So if we can turn to Acts, chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 37 through 47. <coughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Father God, for this time. Lord, we thank you for these these praise reports, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that you are faithful, my God. And Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that all things are possible for you, Lord God. And Father, Lord, it's just us believing, Lord, that you are able, my God. And Father, tonight we are continuing to believe that you are able, Father God. And Father, we're just thankful tonight, Lord God, as we just continue to trust in you, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, and the encouragement and the life that you give us in your word, my God. So we just thank you this day, Father, and we love you this day, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to read from verse 37 through 47, and I am in the English Standard Version, so if it reads a little bit different, that's that's why. <laughs> okay. So here we go. So it'll be in verse 37. It says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done to the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the, the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So this is our scripture tonight that we will be going through. I'm going to touch on a couple of things as we as we go into break down the scriptures. And I just had a couple of things I just want to throw out here right now. Well, as we've been studying the last couple of weeks and we've been going through the book of Acts and the book of Acts chapter 2, we see now that now the Holy Spirit has come and filled the people. We see that we, we, as we read, we find out that all of a sudden everybody here from all these different nations is hearing them speak in their own language. So there's a commotion, there's a rust, there's something going on, and it was loud and it was very evident to the point where it grabbed the attention of all these people that are here for the feast. And so therefore, it's in that time that now Peter with the 11 disciples stands up and starts to declare that this was the promise that was to come. This is what was declared in the scriptures, and he starts to declare about the the promise and this is what you're seeing today and not only that he goes now even further and starts to share the gospel starts to declare who Jesus is not only that he brings it out in such a way that he lets them know you are the ones who crucified him mm-hmm. See, he's making it very personal so he's bringing the gospel he's telling this is Jesus this is the one whom you crucified just as we shared last week when God told Moses the, the, the commandments you broke You know, but how many of us know that God is not looking to destroy or condemn me and you? He's just looking for an acknowledgement from me and you, a response from me and you. And so therefore, when Peter is bringing forth this message, he is bringing it forth in the power now of the Holy Spirit, no longer timid, but he is standing up by the power of God, by the Holy Spirit, and declaring the good news of Jesus Christ. Everything that they had seen, everything they had witnessed, he is now declaring, this is what it is, and not only that he's using the word of God to confirm it. 
He's using the Word of God to show this is what the Word said. So when it says in verse 37, now when they heard this, it's referring to the Gospel. It's referring to all that Peter had shared with them. All that he had declared about truth by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the word tonight is added. And I'm just going to throw this out here. It's just a, it's a, a question that I just want you to kind of ponder through the Bible study tonight. Actually, not really a question. It's more of a statement. You can't add with subtra subtra subtraction. How many of us know that? You can't. You can't add with subtraction. Can you do addition with subtraction? By means of subtraction. Yeah, yeah. It's either 2 plus 2 is 4. Yeah. But 2 minus 2 is 0. There is, they're different. And how many of us know that addition or adding is sometimes a good thing, right? What are some examples that when it's good to be something added to you? Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Salvation. Salvation. Okay. That's good. That, those are some good church answers. I love that. Yeah. But what about some other things? Like some, some uh, you know, what, what, what else is good when you get added to you? Yes. Treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. Okay. Amen. Finances. Finances. There you go. Finances. Amen. This is good. Good. But is there, you know, there's also some stuff that's nice to get some, nice to get a nice little check here and some money, extra money, money in your pocket, right? What else? Compliments. Compliments. Hey, amen. There you go. I like health. Yeah. Definitely. What else? Tax refund. Tax refund. Yeah. There we go. All right, all right. We're in tax season right now, right? Yeah. Amen. Yes, Summer. Uh, good friends and also. Yeah, adding good friends. And possibly growing family if you get married. And Addition to the family and all that. Yeah, in laws, you know, children, grandchildren, maybe not always in laws, but you know, at least grandchildren, you know. <laughs> depends on how you look at it sometimes. You know, some see it differently, you know. There's all kinds of different things. What are some things that are not good to be added, though? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amen. Well, we can all agree, right? Addition, something being added is most of the time a good thing. The only time it's not a good thing is when I keep eating those donuts and I start to see what starts getting added on after that. Amen. That's, that's the part I have to watch out with. But other than that, most of the time, adding and adding something to something is usually in a form of a good, in a good way, in a good thing. So I, salsa. <laughs> there you go. Adding some salsa, right? To the to the burrito until later on I'm, I'm suffering for it but hey it's good in the, at that time there you go but that's a good one I like that see you're adding something and you're making it better amen amen so I just want us to have that idea and thought right now so let's look at a, let's look at a portion of scripture here just in a little bit of example of this and we'll we'll see what I'm, a little bit more of what I'm talking about let's go to uh, Luke um, I believe it's I'm sorry Luke chapter 2 we all remember this book, right? We were in here not too long ago. Luke chapter 2 and verse 51 through 52. If somebody can please read that. Luke chapter 2, verse 51 through 52. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Uh, the next verse as well, verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Amen. So I want us to catch something there. What did he do in wisdom and in stature? He increased. He increased. Added. Added. <laughs> with favor with who? God and man. Not just not God, but and man. But what did he have to do to get there? Obedience. Be submissive to his parents. And it says, and he went down with them. Because this is when Jesus had disappeared. They were looking for him and they said, why did you do this to us? He says, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? All of that. But then at the same time, it says that he still went down with them. He was submissive to them. He was obedient to them. And because of that, he increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. These things 
were added to him as he submitted himself to God. The father, by submitting himself to his parents. Under the authority. authority, And therefore, this was added to him. He grew. He matured. And this is something that me and you should always desire. But it's going to sometimes cost a little bit. Not a little, but it's going to cost a lot. Because it's going to cost, whether you're right or whether you're wrong sometimes, it's going to be to do it to honor God. So, I wanted to open up with that because Jesus is our perfect example. Amen? So, as we're looking at this portion of Scripture, we see that... Peter is declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ the good news. How many of us agree that the gospel is good news, right? Jesus Christ. That's the best news in this world. If you don't believe me, just turn on channel 11. Turn on channel 5. There's no good news out there. (laughs) Even one of the kids agrees with me. I like that. But how many of us know that we, as a body of Christ, we all have that responsibility? To share or to be that witness in this world about the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, you guys don't look like you believe me. Okay, let's go to 2 Corinthians. (laughs) Now you did agree. I just, you know, just want to. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we are going to read verse 16 through 21, if somebody can please read that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 through 21. Do you have to delegate it? No? Anybody else? Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 through 21. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new, a new life has begun. And all this is a gift from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Yep, reconciliation. Amen. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Amen. Amen. And this is a ministry that we all have a responsibility to. It's that ministry of reconciliation. As me and you have been reconciled to God through Christ Jesus. And that that word reconcile is to change, to exchange, or to return to favor with. And it's when you're, just imagine a relationship that is broken, that you don't get along with somebody, you haven't talked to somebody in a long time. And then all of a sudden there's a, there's a forgiveness and you guys come to terms. What happens is, is now there's a reconciliation. You return to favor with that person and now you guys can have that open relationship again of communication because you guys have favor with each other and that's what we're doing that's what the gospel is that's what the message is in this portion of scripture in the book of acts that's what's being proclaimed it's that message of christ to reconcile the world back to god through him That is the ministry. And we all have that that responsibility. The Bible says that we are ambassadors. To be an ambassador is to be a representative. So we're a representative. We're an ambassador here in this world. In a world that is lost. In a world that is blind. In a world that is corrupt. In a world that has no hope. In a world that thinks they don't need God. Or just choose not to believe in Him. Or choose to believe in Him the way they want and think He should or she should be. There's many different thoughts and how people see God. But this is where our responsibility comes in that we know who our God is so we can be those ambassadors. So we can be that representative but not based upon our own knowledge or on what we know but the one who is in me and you to allow him to speak through us and to declare that through our lives. So this is something that we all have a responsibility and that is to let others know that they can be reconciled to God, be returned to favor with God through Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So let's go now, but when that happens, let's look at 1 Corinthians, the first the, the book right before this one. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And if somebody can please read verse 4 through 9 here. Because we're talking about adding. We're talking about added increase. 
And the question is, is, well, who brings the increase through it all? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, let's see, and another, I am of Apollos, you are not car are you not carnal? Uh, questions. Are you not carnal? Um, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? Uh, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. I'm not doing well. It's okay, so keep going. We're good. It's a question, so I have, okay. to have a different inflection on it. Who then is Paul and who then is Apollos? But ministers through who you believe as the Lord gave to each as the Lord gave to each one. Uh, I planted Apollos water. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are you are God's field. You are God's building. Amen. Amen. So who brings the increase? God. So it's not a matter of who's bringing forth the message. It's not a matter of words. No, it's a matter of recognizing that it's all about the Lord. Yes, amen. And it's the Lord that adds. It's the Lord that brings life. It is the Lord's body. And He is the one that does the building up. We all have our part. But it's God that brings the increase. So this is very important to realize as we go back to the scripture here that it's God that brings the increase. Amen? So let's go back to the book of Acts chapter 2. And we're going to go back to our key verse here. To 37 through 47. And so we're going to look at a couple other things here. So we, get, we go through all that to get back here. When it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. So when they heard this, as we said before, who were they speaking? What did they just hear? Goodness. The good news. They just heard about Jesus. They heard about everything they had just witnessed. This is, who you, this is who you crucified. You crucified the Lord, the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ. This is about Jesus. But again, it's not to condemn them. It's not to destroy them, to make them, to, to want to, to tear them down. There's a whole reason and a purpose why the message is going forward. But it's, and this is why. It says, and when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. Another translation may say pricked. The King James Version says they were pricked to the heart. And all that's saying is to pierce the, the pain of mind sharply, to agitate vehemently, and in the Amplified it says emotion of sorrow or remorse and anxiety. So that means that when they heard this word, this word brought such a conviction that it brought sorrow. It brought remorse. They felt bad for what they had just heard and realized and recognized. They brought a, it brought a response. It brought something out of them. And if you ever heard the Word of God, how many of us know that the Word of God is alive? Yes, the Word of God is living. Okay, I don't know if you guys believe me. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Amen. <laughs> God bless you. Hebrews chapter 4, bless you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. Somebody could please read that. Just that one scripture? Uh, yes, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. Or 12 to 13. 12 to 13. It says, uh, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes, and He is the one to whom we are accountable. Ooh, amen. See, so that's what the Word of God does. It'll penetrate the heart, but what it does is it reveals our heart if we allow His Word to penetrate and to bring up that acknowledgement. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, well, how can we confess our sins unless we realize we have sinned? Yeah. Okay. Unless we acknowledge we are a sinner. 
unless we acknowledge that, Lord, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against my spouse. I've sinned against my brother, my sister, my neighbor. It doesn't mean anything until me and you acknowledge it's a sin. Well, it's the same thing when the Word of God is going forth. This is what's going on. They're acknowledging everything that Peter is saying by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's true. We murdered this guy. We saw it happen. We know about this. We heard him. We saw him. And so what they're doing, the Word of God is now bringing forth a remorse, an anxiety. It's bringing forth a response. Oh my, oh my God, what did we do? It's bringing, it can also bring a fear because it's just so much guilt. Imagine you realize, like, oh, we were the ones over there saying, crucify him. Why did I do that? You ever been there? Why did I say that? Why did I do that? If only I wouldn't have went. If only I wouldn't have sent that text. If only I wouldn't. We well, can always say if only, but we did it. <laughs> There's no going back. All there is is the shame and the guilt and the what if. But it's out there. But it's the acknowledgement to at least realize it's out there. Now what am I going to do with it? And that's what the Word of God will do. John 1, 1, 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. John chapter 1, verse, 1 through, uh, four, verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh. Who's the Word? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the very Word of God. And when Jesus is being proclaimed, it is the very Word of God that is being proclaimed. And all that He is, and all that He has done for me and you, there is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. The name of Jesus is very powerful and can bring life. Not just because of the name, but because who is the name. The Bible says that Jesus prays to the Father and says, Protect them in the name that you have given me. In Him there is life. That whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The disciples say, Lord, the demons are subject to us in your name. It's all about the name of Jesus, but in the relationship, it's knowing the one to whom that name belongs to. And there is life in the name of Jesus. But the name of Jesus is also very offensive. For those who do not want to hear it, many people are offended by the message that is going forth here. We'll see that later on when we go deeper into the scriptures in the next couple of chapters. We will see how offended people are by the name of Jesus. Though there are many saved, there are much more opposed. Because the name of Jesus will not always be accepted. The person of who Jesus is will not always be accepted. But for those that do make a decision too, there is life. There is life. And this is why God does this. God doesn't bring the truth to destroy me and you or to have us walk in guilt so we can walk guilty and say, oh man, God, you know, I'm just... we're not to be walking every day, God, please forgive me, forgive me. Every single moment of our life, it's like, no, why don't you just receive the forgiveness, believe you're forgiven and go and live and do. But many times we keep living in shame because we keep tripping up. And it'll happen. We'll go through those seasons, but it's understanding and coming to learn and grow and recognizing, but God, you've delivered me, Lord. But I need your help. But you can walk in freedom and liberty. We are to be walk a life full of repentance, yes. But doesn't mean you need to take every single second of your day to keep asking Him for forgiveness for the same thing He's already forgiven you. Because then are you really truly believing you've been forgiven? Or are you allowing the guilt to settle in? There should be conviction, but you shouldn't be living in condemnation. That's for Satan, don't you? Yeah. It's two different places. Can you repeat that? Huh? There's that again, huh? <laughs> you can live in conviction, but not live in condemnation. He didn't call us to live in condemnation. And we'll get a little bit more into that. 
You don't have to turn here, but I'm going to read this in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. It says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. But look at this part in verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. How many of us know that God wants to have compassion on people? How many of us know that God has had compassion on the world? Very merciful. He did it through Jesus Christ. He showed that love and compassion by His Son paying the price that me and you should have paid. The same compassion that Jesus has here is the same compassion the Father has for me and you. Because they're one. It's the same compassion that the Holy Spirit has. One of the fruits that works in me and you. And it's so important to him that he's saying, pray to the Lord for the harvest that he will send out laborers into his harvest field to let others know about my compassion. (laughs) To let others know how compassionate I am. That this world doesn't have to live in condemnation. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says, For He did not send His Son into the world to condemn it, but to save it through Him. And it goes on further to say the world already knew it's condemned already. Yeah. And how many times have we shared before, when we were living in sin, how many of us knew we were in sin? Yeah. We knew what we did was wrong. Yes. Maybe not everything. I believe after a while we just learned how to convince ourselves that this, this is the way it is. <laughs> or God lives in he, he knows. He knows. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> it's like the Tupac song. That's just the way it is. <laughs> And for some reason, I woke up with that in my head the other day. But, you know, maybe the Lord was trying to speak to me. Huh? It was for this message tonight. That's what it was. But, yeah, we can get there. We can, we've been there. I'm not going to say we get there. We've been there. I know I was there. You know, God's cool with it. You know, God's okay with it. He loves me. He's a loving God. You know, he'll forgive me. But that was just our ignorance. It's just like in anything else we do, even as a Christian. Come on, this, can, can we be, you know, humans here? <laughs> even as a Christian, we can at times start to talk ourselves into things that, yeah, you know, we're good with this. You know, we got, we got grace, we got mercy. You know, God's being patient. It's part of the work and the process in me. <laughs> okay, it's just me. Amen. Just, you know, that's okay. All right, amen. Amen. And turn off the recorder. <laughs> But this is a reality. But see, that's why Jesus came. Because God knows how we are. That's just the result of sin. But let's look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 19. If somebody could read that, please. I can't seem to find it in my Bible today, so. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen. To proclaim the year of the what? Lord's favor. The Lord's favor. Reconciliation is what? To return to the favor of. To return back to the favor of God that is in Christ Jesus. That's what he came to proclaim. There is, there is hope for you today. And this is what Jesus came to do. And he is using the scriptures to declare today is this scripture has been fulfilled in your presence. John 10, 10 says the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. But he has come to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. Jesus did not come to give us death. He came to give us life. And let's look at another scripture here, John chapter 16. All this is being spoken because this is what Jesus came to do. It was to give them an opportunity. 
to let them know that there is hope. Though the message was strong, but it was truth, it was a reality, but the reality is that's what Christ came for. And He fulfilled that in obedience unto the Father. But look at this portion right here. John chapter 16, verse um, 8 through 10 says this, And when He comes, well, who is it referring to when, when it says, And when He? The Holy Spirit. But Jesus, but it's right here, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. And remember we said the Holy Spirit is a, an entity. Yeah, he's a third person, yeah. So the Holy Spirit is not an entity. No, he's a person, amen? So that's why he's saying, and when he comes, referring to the Holy Spirit, look at this part, he will convict, not condemn, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Imagine that. God bless you. He will come to convict the world of sin, showing that this is what sin is, showing the righteousness, but also declaring the judgment. This is what the Holy Spirit's purpose and the work of the Holy Spirit. And it says, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, therefore we understanding in that righteousness that we're righteous in Christ and that we have a relationship with the Father because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. He has judged the world, but the enemy is under his feet. Death is, death is swallowed up. Death lost the victory. And this is what the Holy Spirit work will do. And this is what we're seeing being done here in this portion of Scripture. They are receiving the Word and the Holy Spirit is working. There's a scripture here that says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Amen. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. And whom shall I be afraid? You know, the great news about this is, Peter was not declaring this message and then saying, And Jesus is going to get revenge on all of you. Because <laughs> that could have been a real, that could have been the message. That would be the world's message. So, yeah. At this time right here, he's speaking to the Jews, right? Yes, that's what we're going to, yeah. And also to, at this time, this is the beginning of the church. Yes. The birth of the church. Yes. Because yeah. then, I know that as we go on and stuff, you see where the <coughs> not all Jews believe that he was the Messiah. That's right. The church gets... The Jews and, and those who believe in Jesus Christ get divided. Yeah, this is where you're going to see a lot of this. And this is just the first portion here. And and he's talking to the Jewish people. So they know these scriptures. We, we shared in the last couple of weeks. They know these scriptures. They've heard them. And so this is, again, this is very offensive to many people that are there. Not everybody's receiving this, but there are, there are certain few here that are receiving it. Because they did not believe that he was the Messiah. Exactly. <clears throat> so imagine this. Instead of them having to be afraid of a God who can now kill, destroy them, because they knew the book of, they knew the, they knew the stories of Moses. <laughs> and when God dealt with the people of Israel, he just wiped them out. He told all those under tw over 20 years old, neither one of you are going to enter the promised land. I mean, yeah. when he came down of that mountain, he says, okay, those that are with me stand on this side, and those that are not stand on that side. Land fell out under them. One point in time, send the Levites out. All right, go and just go kill all these people. <laughs> he dealt with things the way it needed to be dealt with then. But that's not how he does it here. Because it wasn't to bring a fear to where God's going to destroy us, but now it's to bring a fear of what, and this is the next question. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They're asking, what shall we do? What are we going to do with this, this news, with this message? What are you telling us? There's, there's, a, there's a drawing within them. What can we do? There's a remorse. What can we do to make this up? What can I do to make this right? They don't know what it is, but they just know there's something in them. And Peter tells them in 38, he says, And Peter said to them, Repent! <laughs> repent! That word repent is to change one's mind to repent. That's John the Baptist and Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> to change one's mind for the better, to turn from sin, to turn to God. Yep. The repentant sinner is in the pro proper condition to accept the divine forgiveness. 
So imagine that. It's in that place of repentance that now, because a heart is convicted, the heart is recognizing, I am wrong, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, or whatever may be going on, but this is where this message is. And now there's hearts that are ready, that are in like expectation, what can I do? God bless you. And he says, repent. And the Amplified, it says, repent is to change your old ways of thinking and turn from your sinful ways. But this is the key, as Pastor Pat said, because he was speaking to the children of Israel, accept and follow Jesus as the Messiah. For them in this time, they would have to acknowledge that He is the Messiah and He is the one that the Scriptures are talking about. This is what they would have to do when it's saying to repent. Jesus said in John the Baptist, same thing, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repenting of our ways of thinking, of our ways of doing things, our ways of speaking. That's why the Bible says to renew your mind daily. Because how many of us know our minds are not always looking that way? <laughs> they wander very easy. You've probably wandered a couple times in Bible study tonight. <laughs> just happens. It just happens. That's just our mind. That's why it's so important to keep our eyes on Jesus. And He's giving them the way. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To be baptized is that outward expression of the inward change. Baptism, water baptism, what it does, it identifies us with Christ and identifies us with the community of believers. They would now be known for what they did. And this would be witnessed by many. It's also a condition of discipleship and a sign of faith. And why we do it is because Jesus did it and He also commanded it. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Imagine this part right here. What Jesus had told them in Matthew, they are now seen come to pass. Imagine, I, I can't even, I mean, I'm just thinking about it, it's like, wait a minute, wow. Like, they must, he must have been speaking this also, wait a minute, this is what he told us to do. And now this is the first time that we're seeing this happen. And he's saying, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is an awesome moment because this word is coming to pass. And what did we say about the prophet? How do you know a prophet? Comes true. Comes true. And how many of us know that our faith comes from believing? Let's go to Romans 8. I'm sorry, Romans 10. And I'm going to read verse 8 through 17. Hold your place in Acts, though, but we're going to read this. In Romans chapter 10, verse 8 through 17. And it says here, But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on Him whom they have not believed? 
And how are they to believe in Him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they, shall, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. So what saves me and you? The Word of God. How do you become saved? How did you become saved? Was it believing what God says? Was it believing in who Jesus is? And I say this to us today because many times it may get confused that I guess there's a, in, in this portion right here where it says, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, there's two ways of looking at it. Some believe it says for the forgiveness of sins or because of the forgiveness of sins. And so therefore there's certain teachings out there that will tell me and you that without baptism, water baptism, then you're not saved. And they could use, and it's, been, it's used this way, and many will believe that. But we're reading it here today that our f- salvation and our faith comes by hearing and acknowledging and putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, water baptism is definitely baptism is definitely a sign of discipleship because the Lord commands it. He was baptized, and so therefore we are also baptized because He says to do it. But it's also an outward expression of what's already taking place inwardly. All it is is we're just letting the world know this is my faith and this is who I identify myself with, with Christ. But it's already something that took place within you when you put your faith in, the Jesus, in Jesus Christ. So I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page on that, that we understood that salvation is when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and believe in who He is. And a perfect example is the man on the cross. When Jesus told him, Today you will be with me in paradise. He put his faith in Jesus right there at the cross. And the Lord acknowledged him because he acknowledged they deserved to be there, but he didn't. He acknowledged he was sinless. It's a beautiful picture. As I've shared before, a man's worst day became his best day. Verse 39 says, For the promise is for you and for your children. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2, verse 39. It says, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. So the promise is a divine assurance. How many of us love to receive the promise? And we were talking about this, I believe, uh, two weeks ago. How God had made the covenant, but now we have a better covenant in Christ Jesus. And how when the Holy Spirit came and filled the church, this was the sign and this was showing that God kept His promise. This was the fulfillment of the promise and we are sealed with that Holy Spirit today. And that promise is the Holy Spirit. And the reason why it says that is because... This is the one who started it in this chapter when the Holy Spirit came upon all the disciples and those in that upper room. That was the first. It was the Holy Spirit that started to speak through these disciples and these followers of Christ that got everybody's attention. It was the Holy Spirit speaking. It was the Holy Spirit working. And how many of us know that it's the Holy Spirit drawing? Yes. Peter's not speaking on his own accord. It's the Holy Spirit speaking and working through Peter, through the Word of God, to now convict the hearts of the people and to draw the people to God the Father through Jesus Christ. You don't have to turn here, but just if you're taking notes, John 6, 44 says... No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Is the Holy Spirit part of the Father? Yes, yes. Yeah. 
answer was the Holy Spirit who draw who drew me in you. Who can draw those today who, who maybe don't believe yet. Or maybe running from God. But can I tell you something? The Holy Spirit is powerful. The Word of God is alive, living, and active. The power of the cross is powerful. The resurrection. God the Father, God of all, creator of the heavens and the earth. He is able to draw those to Him because He drew me and you to Him. Acts chapter 2 again, verse 40, it says, And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. To witness, he was witnessing to them, to testify, and he did this earnestly to exhort them. It was a strong encouragement. He is encouraging them. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. He spoke many other words, and he's encouraging them. But what I love about this portion is, it's just like any other scripture you read in the Old Testament. When you look at Jesus' ministry, and now you see here in the ministry, did you catch something there? He says, save yourselves. He put the responsibility on them. It wasn't to say that they had to work for their salvation. They had to choose to believe it. And that word save is just basically to escape. To escape from this crooked generation. To escape from the bondage. To escape from the chains. To escape from the oppression and the depression and all the things of the world, the confusion. To escape. To be saved out of this life. From being blind. From being, being deaf. From being mute. From being lame. To be saved. But he's putting that responsibility on them because they had to choose to believe it. And it says in verse 41, So those who received His word were baptized, and there were added, there's that word, that day about 3,000 souls. Okay. I'm sorry, but when I read this, it reminded me of an I Love Lucy. I don't know if you guys watch I Love Lucy. But there's one when they go on, a, a, it's a husband and wife, and of course Ricky doesn't want his wife there. And he goes up there and tells a joke and he says, Did you ever hear did you hear about the fire at the shoe factory? And then Lucy jumps in, I bet you some heel started it. <laughs> but then Ricky gets upset and he says, then he's he says, No, 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 I'm supposed to answer. He says, he says, a hundred souls were lost. <laughs> But right here, there was 3,000 souls saved. Amen. Not shoes, but, you know, living souls. I was just going to ask you. <laughs> living souls that were saved. It says that 3,000 were added to them that day. And that word added is to join. They joined them. In the, and what it was, it wasn't that they joined them. They now identified themselves with Christ. And in that, they were now identified with the believers whose faith was in Christ. And imagine this, and I shared this earlier. Even though 3,000 people is a lot of people, but it says the number of people that was in Jerusalem at this time was about 100 to 120,000 people. And there was a lot more during the feast. So there was even a lot more than 120,000 people most likely there in Jerusalem at this time. So when you look at the numbers, it's very small percentage compared to the amount of people that were there to the amount of people that in this message were saved. But still, it was 3,000 lives that were saved. So not everyone believed, but those who did now became saved in Christ Jesus. Don't ever let the numbers dis discourage you. Thank you. It's not about the numbers. Because the Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Yep. When me and you repented and chose to give our lives to the Lord, there was a celebration in heaven over that. Yeah. And to this day, there was a celebration every time one person gives their heart to Jesus. Amen. 
We're not looking to get numbers. We're looking for lives to be saved. Yes. Amen. Not to be added to New Living Way Church. Not to be added to a program, no. To be added to the kingdom of God that is now in Christ Jesus, to the body of Christ. So now we're going to close up with verse 42 to 47. And it says, and they, I'm sorry, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing them, the proceeds to all, as, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor ooh, there's that word and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved so I'm gonna, I want us to look at a couple things that were being done here they were steadfast in doctrine this is the church being built up they were steadfast in fellowship. They were steadfast in the Lord's table. Steadfast in prayer. Steadfast in baptism. And steadfast in praise and joy. These were all the things that were coming out of this time. This is what they were doing. The church was being established. Yep. And in this time... This was known as how they were sharing everything with one another. It says that it's known as communism, not communism. Can you say that word again? Com communism. Like communism. Communism. But not communism. And the difference that it gives in this, this is from a footnote as I was going and studying this. It says communism is defined like this. So communism, as you see here in the Bible, is what is mine is thine. So basically, I'm willing to share what I have. Communism is what is thine is mine. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> so, those are the differences it gives in that one. And this was good. You gotta tell that to Bernie. This was good because they recognized this was the fruit of repentance. This was a fruit of a life change. These were the fruits that my, they realized that God, everything that I have is not mine. I'm realizing everything is yours. And they helped one another. They encouraged one another. And they grew together. So imagine this. The people are seeing this. The people are seeing them steadfastly together, devoted to the teaching, to prayer, and all these things. Because you have people that are excited. Their hearts have been convicted, but they were left in the conviction. They were able to repent and now have life. They were baptized. They were given life. They have salvation and restoration and reconciliation to God the Father. They've been restored to the favor of God and of man. And because of that, it was not only what was being said, but how they were living. So imagine that there must have been so many people looking to them and saying, man, I want what they have. Mm -hmm. It was by the church growing that it says that the numbers were being added because they were seeing the lives that now were being lived. And keep in mind here, the reason why they had to go and they had to go to the houses in these private places, because remember, these were Jewish men and women. So just because they put their faith now in Christ doesn't mean they rejected their Jewish religion. They saw Jesus as the fulfillment of the Jewish religion. He is the Messiah. So this is why when, you, when we're continuing to read in the book of Acts, this is why they still went to the synagogue. They still went to the temples, to the temple. Because they were doing this now with the recognition of who Christ is, that He is the Messiah. But the only thing is, is there was conflict because the Jewish did not believe in Christ. So this is where they had to start going into the homes. And they had to start having these private meetings because it was just too much conflict in the synagogue and in the temple. But they never walked away from the Jewish faith. This became the completion of the Jewish faith. And it says that the church grew in this. 
And we might look at it and say, man, why can't we be like that anymore? In reality is we should. We should realize that all that we have is not that it's yours, but it's God's. We're not the owners. We're not the owners. We're not even the owners of our own life. We're called to be a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. That's our reasonable service unto Him. Our reasonable worship. It's that laying down of our lives and recognizing my life's not my own, it belongs to you, Lord. There is like a unity, such a strong unity with them because they were also subject under the apostles. Mm-hmm. So you saw the leadership there and the unity of it and the fellowship, but also the communion, what Christ had taught them um, in communion about um, taking communion with each other and stuff, but you see such a unity within that body of Christ, and really that's a picture of what the church really should be. It yeah. shouldn't be as divided as it is today with all the denominations and all the political stuff that goes on everything. It's really the unity of who Christ is and what He did for us on the cross. doesn't make any difference who you are or what color you are, or whether you're female or male. It's all about Jesus Christ and the church. And that was their focus here. It was all about Jesus. This was exciting for them. This was new. This was something that they have never experienced before. And it wasn't just a feeling. It was the Holy Spirit in them, bringing them together and working in this area. You know, and we may look at that and say that, that you know, man, if we could get back to that place. But, but recognize, okay, the church was just starting. Yeah. It was a necessary time for this, and this was the place for it, especially in that time, because they also had opposition from the Jewish leaders and all these different people. But don't don't get it. Uh, I don't want to say don't get it twisted, but I guess that's what I'm about saying. <laughs> because they weren't a perfect church either. No, they weren't. Because the more that we and we look into the Bible. Acts chapter 1, 6, verse 1 says they started to complain about the distribution of the food. Yeah, yeah. First Corinthians chapter 11, Paul has to tell them, why don't you eat at home? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7 through 10 says, he who does not work does not eat. Yeah. Talking about busybodies. Because how many of us know that in this time, as beautiful as it was, you had people that started taking advantage. <laughs> Free food? Yeah. Free stuff? <laughs> so don't start giving away all your stuff now, okay? Because uh, believe me, there's people that use wisdom in who you help. Don't just help just anybody. Use God's wisdom. Because you don't want them to also become a leech. Yeah. As the Bible says, you know, I, I'm going to paraphrase, but it's like the leech says, give, give. Gimme, gimme. Gimme, gimme. <laughs> so sometimes you get that once in a while and you're like, okay, you give a little bit and all of a sudden you feed the birds and they just, oh dang, now they keep coming back, you know? <laughs> sometimes people could be like that. You know, they start to become dependent on you and they'll take advantage of that. And this started to happen in the church. So it's not that it stayed perfect in that. And how many of us know that there's no perfect church, only a perfect Savior? Amen. That's why it has to be about Jesus. If you're looking for a perfect church, I love the perfect example of it. As soon as you get there, it's not perfect no more. <laughs> because it's all about Jesus. I mean, think about it. We complain about everything. <laughs> I can't imagine how long this went on until somebody started complaining, that again? Is that what they made again? (laughs) 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 Sounds like us. We complain about free food. And I'm pretty sure they had their issues as well. The Bible doesn't doesn't break that out. So many times we look at like, oh my God, I wish we were that perfect. Yeah, why can't we be like that sometimes? And we are to be like that. But we also got to realize there's some realities that also came along with this. But this was a church building up and growing together and learning together. And what they were is they were subject, like Pastor Pat said, to the authority, to the Word of God, seeking the Lord. And allowing God to work these things out. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. And 
I'm going to read this for time's sake. It says, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. I'm going to go to 23, I'm sorry. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So imagine, we see the church in the book of Acts. Everybody's coming together. Everybody wants to be in church. It's exciting. It's new. And then we get to the book of Hebrews where there's persecution. And now not everybody's showing up to church. Then we get to the book of Hebrews and people start getting going through some stuff. Start having issues at home. You're always in church. <laughs> And all of a sudden, Paul has to be encouraged to write this word. Let us not neglect the meeting of together, coming together. Well, look at that today. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people who won't even go to church. Instead, they stay at home and just watch it on TV. <laughs> yeah. And we are to be a body of Christ that comes together because we need the fellowship. We need to be encouraged one another. We need each other because that's when we realize I'm not alone. And we become tangible because Christ is tangible. But we become, He becomes tangible through all of us and the love that we show and have for one another. And as we keep our eyes on the Lord, as we focus on the Lord and we repent and live a life of repentance, fear and trembling, giving glory to God and keep our eyes on the Lord. And we live this out with the help of the Holy Spirit, believing His Word. We don't have to worry about adding anybody. Because who brings the increase? Jesus. God brings the increase. You want to see change in your life? What did Jesus do? He submitted Himself. But because He submitted Himself, He grew and increased in favor and in stature with God and man. You want stuff added to your life? You want to increase? Start with submission. We want to see others? They'll come to repent. Just know that God will draw them. You can't save them. I can't save them. But God can. How many of us today have family members that we want added to the kingdom of God? Amen. Co-workers, yeah. neighbors, our community, government leaders, leaders in this world, those that are in entertainment, different ones that we, we like their music, love their acting, and we pray, Lord, that they would only know you. That's true. The true you. Well... That'll start by us first continuing to remain steadfast in believing who Jesus is, not compromising who He is, but believing and declaring who, the, who Jesus is, the good news. Living it, walking it out, and trusting Him and believing God that He can add those to the kingdom of God when He draws them as He drew me and you by His Spirit. Amen. Sister Karen, you had something? Yeah, I was very blessed yesterday to um, join with a, a fellow believer that's been sick in Holy Communion. And this was such a blessing to me, 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, and the breaking of bread, the next scepter, and awe came upon every soul with wonders and signs. So, man, that is what we're looking for for this, this young girl, you know. Amen. Communion is a blessing, and that it ushers in that health and wholeness. Yes, you know? it's in the blood. And so that, that just blessed my heart reading that. Amen. You know? Yes, and that's where the Lord starts to do the work, and that's what we're going to be getting into. It's not by them trying to make anything happen. It's as they focused on the Lord that the Lord started to do mighty works and miracles through their lives, but to bring Him glory. Amen. Not the disciples' glory, to bring Him glory. Amen. They weren't going out there looking to, have to, to plan this to happen. They were just going on in their normal days, as we're going to read next week. They're just going on in their normal day. But because their eyes on the Lord, the Lord started to move and do great miracles to them. Amen.